Hey guys, hi and welcome to this session. Today's topic is weavers and smelters and factory owners. So it is going to be an amazing session. So let us start. So introduction. The English East India Company came to India to trade in Indian goods. So slowly it occupied our nation, nation and the pattern of trade changed over the decades. So the English East India Company, they came into India to trade Indian goods. So they came to India to trade Indian goods and slowly it occupied our nation and the pattern of trade. Okay, so they slowly occupied our nation and pattern of trade. Pattern of trade changed over the decades. So the pattern of uh, trade changed over the decades. So the crafts and industries of India during British rule focused on two industries textiles and iron and steel okay so the crafts and industries of india during the british rule british was ruling us right so during that time the craft and industries of india ruled for british during the british rule focused on two industries textiles iron and steel so the industry industrialization okay so the industrialization of britain had a close connection so they had a close connection with the conquest and colonization of india so they had a uh, they had an industrialization of british had close connection with the conquest and colonization of india okay so the industrialization of britain had a close connection with conquest and colonization in india and in 18th century india was lead india was leading nation in terms of craft so the india was leading the leading nation in the terms of craft and trade but the but with industrial industrial revolution okay so india was leading uh, india was leading nation in the term of craft and the trade but with the industrial level revolution okay so the britain came to know as workshop of the world so the britain came to know as the workshop of the world okay so and the with the growth of the industrial production british industrialists began to see india as a vast market for their industrial products and the over years manufactured goods for britain began flooding in india so with the growth of industrial production so the, with the growth of industrial production british industrialized industrialists began to see india so they began to see india as the vast market vast market for their industrial product for their industrial product british british industrialized industrialists began to see india as a vast market and over the years man they manufactured goods for britain began flooding in india okay so now indian textiles and world market so indian cotton textiles in west africa okay so around uh, 1750 around 1750 india was world's largest producer of cotton textiles so around 1750 india was the world's largest producer of cotton textiles okay so the indian textile was renowned renowned both for finer quality finer quality best quality and exquisite exquisite craft craftsmanship so okay so and from the 16th century european traders began buying indian textiles for sale in europe so x x q side okay sorry x q side so from from the 16th century european traders began buying indian textiles for sale in europe so in the 15, 16th century the europeans you know right europe continent so european traders began buying indian textiles so they began buying indian textiles for sale in europe because india was indian textile renowned both for its final quality okay so moving on now the world tell us histories so indian textiles were famous in western markets under different names such as muslin calico chintz 
bandana bandana so muslim the material was first made in the city of mosul now in iraq so it, now in iraq from which it derived its name so muslim the material was first made in the city of mosul it is now in iraq from which it derived its name okay so and the word muslim muslim means any finely woven textile used for making clothes so the word muslin means fine finally woven textile so the finally woven textiles used for making clothes so the finally woven, woven textile used for making cloth is known as muslin okay so are you guys understanding are you guys understanding okay so calico the word calico is a general name for all the cotton textiles used for the used for making clothes so the word calico is general name it's a general name for all cotton all cotton textiles used for making clothes so uh, all cotton textile used for making clothes is known as calico and when the portuguese first came to india so when the portuguese first came to india in search of spices they landed in calicut now calicut so sorry now calicut when the portuguese first came to india in search of spices they landed in calicut okay so on the kerala coast in southwest india so on the kerala coast southwest india and the cotton textiles which they took back to europe along with the spices came to be called calico so the cotton textiles which they look they took back to europe they took back to europe from the calicut along with spices came to be called calico okay so chins the word chins meaning a printed cotton cloth so it's a printed cotton cloth and is a term derived from the hindi word chin okay so it is derived from the hindi word chin and a cloth with small colorful flowery design so it is a cloth with small colorful flowery designs and bandana so the word bandana which refers to any bright color bright colored and printed scarf tied around the neck of the head so a scarf tied around the neck of the head is derived from the hindi word for tying bandana okay so moving on now the indian textiles in european markets so i have told you the uh, the europeans took from 16th century the european traders began buying indian textiles for europe okay so now the popularity of indian textiles during 18th century varied the wool and silk markets in england so they began protesting against the import of indian cotton textiles so the they began to protesting against okay against the import of indian textiles okay so the calico act so in 1720 british government banned the use of printed cotton textiles in england so the british government banned banned use of printed cotton textiles in england the law was called calico act okay so now at the at this time textile industries had just begun to develop in england so this time the textile textile industries had just began to develop in england so the english textile producers found it difficult to complete with the indian textile so the english textile producers found it difficult to complete with the indian textiles and hence they prevented the entry of the indian textiles into england okay so to overcome the stiff competition from the indian textiles in the european market the english weavers invented new machines to make cloth cheaper so that to overcome this stiff the stiff com competition from indian textiles in the european market the english weavers invented new machines 
to make clothes cloth cheaper okay so they invented new machine to make clothes cheaper and in 1764 the spinning jenny was invented by john kaye which increased the productivity of traditional spindles so in seven i will explain you what is spinning jenny so in 1764 the the john kaye which increase uh, he invented the spinning jenny increased the productivity of the traditional spindle so now let us look let us look what is spinning jenny so now what is spinning jenny the spinning jenny is a multi spool the here is a spinning jenny you can see the image the spinning jenny is a multi spool spinning wheel okay so it's a multi spool spinning wheel the device dramatically reduced the amount of work needed to produce yarn. A single worker was able to work I eat or more spools at once. Okay. So, was able to work eight or more spools. Sorry, eight or more spools at the at once. So, uh, just a single worker, a single worker, I think a single worker was able to work eight or more spools at once, at once, okay. So, and in 1786, the invention of the steam engine, Richard R. R. Cry revolutionized cotton textile weaving, okay. So, in the, uh, the invention of the steam engine by Richard R. Cry, R. Cry, Revolutionized cotton textile weaving. So, who is Richard Arkwright? Now, let us look who is he. So, Richard Arkwright. Arkwright's achievement was to combine power, machinery, semi skilled labor, and a new raw material like cotton to create mass production. So, his achievement was to combine the machinery, semi-skilled labor, power and the uh, cotton or the new raw material to create a mass production. So, the cloth could now be woven cheaply in immense quantities. So, now the co cotton could be, uh, so the, now the cloth could be now woven cheaply in immense qualities. Okay. So, however, Indian textiles continue to dominate world trade till the end of the 18th century. So, the, okay. So, however, the Indian textile continue to dominate. They continue to dominate world trade till the end of the 18th century. Okay. So, the Dutch, the French and the English. So, the Dutch, the French and the English trading company, companies made a huge profit from the textile trade. Okay. So, they made a huge profit from the textile trade and these companies purchased cotton and silk textiles in India and paid for it in silver. Okay, so they, that companies purchased cotton and silk textiles from India, okay, from our country, in, country India and paid for it in silver, okay. So when the English East India Company gained political power in Bengal, so when the English East India Company gained the political power in Bengal, okay, so it stopped paying for its it with precious materials. So it stopped pay, um, like paying paying the for precious materials. So okay, so and the company collected revenues. So the company company co collected revenues from the peasants. And Zamindas used this revenue to buy Indian textiles. Okay, so the company collected revenues from the peasants and Zamindas used, used this revenue to buy Indian textiles. So the major weaving centers in India. So first one is New Delhi. The second one is Panipat. Third one is Ludhisana. Fourth one is Amritsar. Fifth one is Jaipur. Sixth one is Jodhapur. Seventh one is Bai. Bilwara, 8th one is Ahmedabad, 9th one is Surat, 10th one is Mumbai, and 11th one is Ichal Karanji, and 12th one is Bangalore, and 13th one is Kananur, 14th one is Cochin, 15th one is Coimbatore, and 16th one is Madurai, 
17th one is Tirupur, 18th one is Karur, 19th one is Erod, 20th one is Salem, 21th one is Chennai, 22nd is Hyderabad, 23rd is Narsapur, 24th is Calcutta. Okay, so Indian weavers. So weavers specialize in weaving. So the Indian weavers, the weavers specialize in weaving. Okay, so and they pass their skills from one generation to the next. So they pass their skills from one generation to the next. And some of the viewers community in India were the Tanti of the, the Tanti viewers of Bengal. So the some of the viewers community in India were the Tanti of viewers of Bengal, the Julahas or Momin viewers of North India, and Sal or, or sorry and Kaikola and Divangs of South India. Okay. So the now the art of the weaving. So the cotton was first spun into yarn. So the cotton was sp first spun into the yarn. Okay, and this that was called the spinning and was done by it was done by women. Okay, and the charka, you know, right? The charka and the takli, takli were household spin household spinning instruments. So the the charka and takli were the household spinning instruments, and the the thread was spun on the charka okay so the thread was spun on the charka and the rolled on the tackle okay so a charka when the spinning was over the thread was woven into cloth by weaver weaving was mostly done by men so the when the spinning was over the thread okay so when so when the spinning was over the thread was woven into cloth by weaver weaving was mostly done by men okay now the decline okay now the decline of indian textiles so the development of cotton industries in britain after affected textile producers in india in several ways so the development of cotton industries in britain affected the textile producers in india okay in india in the several ways in many ways so the indian textiles now had to compete compete with British textiles in the European and American markets. So now the Indian textiles had to compete with the British and British textiles in the European and American markets. So now the exporting textiles to England become increasingly difficult as very high duties were imposed on Indian textiles imported into Britain. Okay, and in the beginning of the 19th century, okay, 19th century, English made made cotton textiles were preferred to indian goods and the indian textiles lost their market in africa so the indian textiles lost their market in the africa and america and europe also so the indian textiles declined okay so now continue so the thousands of weavers in india did not have any work so the thousands of weavers in india did not have any work and bengal weavers were the worst hit so the Bengal weavers were the worst hit and the English and European companies stopped buying Indian goods. So the English and European companies like American and European companies stopped buying Indian goods and during the 18th, 1830s British, cloth, British cotton cloth flooded Indian markets. So the British cloth, cotton clothes cotton cloth flooded Indian markets and in 1880s two third of all cotton clothes worn by Indians were of the cloth produced in Britain. So the two third, if you, can, uh, if you take three part in the two part also the, the cotton clothes were uh, the cotton clothes were worn by Indians were made by were worn by Indians were made by the cloth produced in Britain. Okay. So, and this affected the entire textile. So, this affected the entire textile industry in India. And thousands of rural women lost their jobs. So, the, uh, the uh, women were weaving. Uh, sorry. The women were. Uh, okay. I will tell you. The women were like spinning, right? The women were spinning. The this was called spinning, and it was done by women. So the spinning was done by women, okay. And spinning was done by women. So the women lost their job, okay. So the women lost their job. Thousands of rural women, rural women lost their job. And now the ray of hope. 
so during the national movement so during the national mo movement mahatma gandhi urged people to boycott boycott imported textiles and use hand spun and hand woven clothes so during the national movement mahatma gandhi urged people to boycott imported textiles and the to boycott uh, imported textiles and use hand spun and hand woven clothes the hand spun and hand woven clothes to wear and kari gradually become a symbol of nationalism so the the kari uh, gradually become the become the uh, symbol of the nationalism and the charka came to represent india and it was put at the center of tricolor flag of indian national congress adopted in 1931 so the tricolor okay so the charka came to represent india and it was put at the center of the tricolor flag of the indian national congress adopted in 1931 okay so now the cotton mills come up now in 1854 the cotton mill in india was set up as a spinning mill so the uh, the well, first cotton mill in india was set up as a spinning mill in bombay in bombay okay and in 9 in 1900 over 84 mills started operating in bombay but colonial government did not support the mill advancement by denying the imported duty on british goods so the mill did not support the mill advancement by denying the import duty on british goods okay and in 1861 in 1861 the first mill in ahmedabad was started so in 1861 the first mill in ahmedabad was started and in 1862 the first mill in kanpur was started okay and the textile mills faced some problems the textile mills faced some problems initially and the mills found it difficult to compete with cheap textiles imported from britain okay so they it was uh, difficult it they found difficult to uh, compete with cheap textiles imported from britain okay and in most countries government supported industrialization by imposing heavy duties on imports okay so the in most countries government supported industrialization by imposing heavy duties on imports okay and the first major boost the first major boost in the development of cotton factory production in india was during the first world war so the first major boost first major boost of in the development of cotton factory in the development of cotton factory production in india was during the first world war first world war okay and during this time the textile imports from britain declined and indian factories were called upon to produce cloth for military supplies so the uh during this time the textile from britain declined and indian factories were called upon to produce cloth for military supplies okay now here is an example mumbai textile mills you can see and manchester of india ahmedabad that also you can see now the sword of tipu sultan and woods steel so tipu sultan ruled in mysore till 1799 he fought four wars with the british and dead fighting with his sword in his hand okay tipu's sword are now part of valuable collection in museums in england tipu sultan's swords so the swords were special as they were incredibly hard and sharp it could easily rip through through the opponents armor so the swords were very special and as yes, they were incredibly hard and sharp it could easily rip through the opponent's armor so this quality of the sword came from a special type of high carbon steel called woods so the woods uh, was produced all over south india woods steel when made into its swords produced a very sharp edge with a flowing water pattern so this pattern came from very small carbon so this pattern came from the very small carbon crystals embedded in the iron okay so now the woods steel okay so the woods steel was produced all over south india by mixing iron with 
charcoal in small clay okay so in small clay pots and keep kept it for smelting furnace okay and by in it get uh, temperature control of the furnace steel ingots were produced so the the by the intricate uh, temperature control of the furnace steel ingots were produced okay and making of tipu sultan sword now the making of tipu sultan sword so francis buchanan okay buchanan taught through mysore in 1800 so okay he and um, he like taught but through Mysore in 1800, a year after Tipu Sultan's death, he has written uh, about the unique technique, about the technique used to prepare sword. So, sword. He had um, written about the technique used to make sword and wood steel was produced in many hundreds of smelting furnaces in Mysore. Okay. So, now, in these furnaces, iron was mixed with charcoal. So, now I must mix it with charcoal and put inside small clay pots. Are you guys understanding? Are you guys understanding? Put it in the live chat. Are you guys understanding? So now the through an intricate control of temperature, the smelters produce steel ingots that were used for sword making. So, through an intricate control of temperature, the smelters produce steel ingots that were used for sword making. Okay. And now, abundant furnaces in villages. So, as the British established political power in India, the production of boots, steel, stopped and iron smelting furnaces were abandoned. So, now as the British established political power in India, the production of boots, steel, uh, stopped and the iron smelting furnaces were abandoned. Okay. Now, the reasons for decline of iron smelting. Now, the reason for decline of iron smelting. Okay. So, one reason was the new forest laws. When the colonial government prevented people from entering the reserve forest, the iron smelters could not find wood for charcoal and would not get iron ore. So, defying forest. Okay. So, one uh, one reason was the new forest laws. One reason was the new forest laws that when the colonial government prevented people from entering the reserve forest, the iron smelters could not find wood or charcoal for and could not get iron ore. Okay. So, they could not get iron ore and defying forest laws than they often entered the forest and collected wood secretly but they could not sustain their occupation on this basis for long so after much effort they were allowed but had to pay greater tax they were allowed but they had to pay greater taxes which often reduced their so by late 19th century iron and steel was being imported from britain so iron and steel was uh, being imported from britain and this Invitability lowered the demand for for iron produced by local smelters. Okay, so this demand, uh, this uh, invitability, in, invitability lowered the demand demand of sorry for iron produced by local smelters. Iron smiths in India began using the imported iron to manufacture utensils and implements lowered the lowered the demand for the iron production by local iron smelters. Okay. So, this was the reason for decline of the iron smelting. Okay. Are you guys understanding? So, now iron and steel. Iron and steel factories come up in India. So, in the year of 1904, American geologist Charles Bell and Dora G. Tata discovered iron ore in the Rajahara hills of Chhattisgarh. So they uh, discovered the iron ore in Rajahara hills of Chhattisgarh. The Ajaria community were native inhabitants of this region. Okay. So the Rajahara hills had one of the finest ores in the world. So the, that hill had one of the finest horse, ores in the world and the Tats were not able to start their own uh, iron and steel factory near the Rajhara hills as the region were very dry 
okay so the as the region were very dry the steel factory needed plenty of water so the steel factory needed plenty of water and a few years later a large area of forest was cleared on the banks of the river subarna reksha subarna to set up the factory okay so to set up the factory and the industrial township was named jamshedpur jamshedpur you know you also you know jamshedpur jamshedpur you have heard somewhere right so jamshedpur are you guys understanding so jamshedpur after dorab ji tata's father jam jamshed ji tata so that was the iron and steel factories come up with in india are you guys understanding put it in the live chat okay moving on tata iron and steel company t i s c o so the tata iron and steel company t i s c o that came up in jamshedpur began producing steel in 1912 so the t i s c o was set up and at an opportune time so all through the late 19th century india was imported steel that was manufactured in britain so expansion of the railways in india had provided a huge market for rails and that britain produced so the expansion of railways in india had provided a huge market rails that britain produced so the british experts in india Indian railways were unwilling to believe that goods quality still could be produced in India. So, in 1914, the First World War broke out. So, the, in 1914, First World War broke out and steel produced in Britain had now to meet the demands of war in Europe. Okay. So, now continue. So, imports of British steel into India declined dramatically and the Indian railways turned into Tisco. T I S E O for supply of railways. Okay, so as the war dragged on for several years, Tisco had to produce shells. So they had to produce shells and carry carriage wheel of the war. So by 1919, the colonial government was buying 90% of the steel manufactured by T I S E O. Soon the T I S E O Tisco became the biggest steel industry in the British Empire. So it became the biggest steel industry in british empire the iron and steel and cotton textiles industry industries expanded only were british imports into india declined on the and the market for indian industrial goods increased this look this took place during the first world war and after so this took place after the first world war and after okay so let's move on as the independence movement gathered strength, the industrial class became the strongest. So, the, as the independence movement gathers the strength, the industrial class became stronger. Okay. So, the British government struggled to maintain its control over India. It had to give in to many demands. Okay. It has many demands of the racing indians in the last decades of its colonial rule okay so here is an iron iron ore collecting from my tata iron and steel company you can see there so that's all for today's session and how was this session comment down below if you like this session subscribe and see you in the next session bye